Strike One series of talks uh, organized by the iHub Quantum Technology Foundation. <laughs> and today I am pleased to welcome Dr. Ashish Arora for talking on an interesting topic in advanced uh, condensed matter physics. Very trendy topic uh, as far as I can understand. I am not from the field, but uh, looking at the title seems to be a very exciting topic. Now, I think some of you already know Dr. Ashish, but uh, in the interest of everybody, I would like to quick, uh, briefly introduce him. So, Dr. Ashish did his PhD in TIFR Mumbai in uh, 2014. Then he went on to work at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory at Grenoble, where he was a CNRS postdoctoral fellow. After a year, he uh, won a prestigious uh, Humboldt Fellowship from the German uh, uh, Research Foundation and he went to Münster, right? Yeah. yeah, he went to Münster in Germany and then after a couple of years of working there, he got a, another uh, prestigious um, uh, DFG uh, award for starting his own uh, small group within the institute and he was a junior group leader there until 2021 and then we have him here at ICER since then. We have had him here at ICER since then and uh, uh, Dr. Ashish, please come over. Thank you very much, <coughs> Umakant, the project, di project director of iHub, Sangeeta, the CEO of iHub, and all of you for giving me this opportunity talk to talk to you today. So maybe I can turn this light off. You want more? Yeah. It's all about light and you are making it dark. <laughs> 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 then there will be light soon. Okay. So, I will be discussing about some experiments which we have been doing with our collaborators in the last six or seven years. Mostly in uh, Grenoble. So, this is Grenoble. This is a valley. So, I will be talking about valleys as well, but not these kinds. So, are these mountains and Grenoble's laboratory, which is a high magnetic field laboratory, where some of the largest magnetic fields are produced of the world, is located there. So, I got the postdoc there as Omakant uh, told. And then uh, I was a postdoc in University of Münster. So, most of the experiments that I will be discussing today have been done in these three places. This is Mumbai, by the way. This is TIFR. Quite a lovely location just at the seashore and now I am here of course. So, my area of research is to explore recently these two dimensional materials where a single sheet of a material is just one atom thick and its thickness is a hundred thousand times thinner than a human hair. So, you put hundred thousand of them together and you make a thick thickness of human hair. Yeah? So, they are really thin materials. You cannot be having anything thinner than that. No, it's okay. I thought. Turn on the light to, to shoot you actually. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this should be enough then. That okay? Yeah. That okay. Okay. So I study this uh, Coulomb bound composites such as electron hole pairs such as excitons or trions or bi excitons or charged by excitons in magnetic fields. I will be talking about all of these effects today. And I have uh, summarized all of this my area of research just last year. I used the time of pandemic to write an article which is uh, oriented towards students essentially. It is called Magneto Optics of Layer 2 Dimensional Semiconductors and Heterostructures Progress and Prospects. So, you are welcome to read this. Okay, so, today I will be talking initially about the optical processes in semiconductors. I think there is some feedback uh, from the top maybe. Under the speaker. Yeah, exactly. Then I will go on to talking about some valleys in two dimensional semiconductors and I will tell what these are. I will discuss magneto optics of 2D semiconductors on the point of view of excitons, trions, interlayer excitons and controlling valleys using magnetic field and I will also discuss how new devices can be created using all of these. And finally, I will discuss my recent work which is one of my most favorite one in developing high precision magneto optics and we will discuss initial results. Okay, let us discuss some basics first before moving on to the advanced stuff because I notice there are lots of undergrads here as well. 
So, we have to discuss optical processes in semiconductor to so conductors to learn things which I am going to talk later. Okay. Semiconductors are materials which have intermediate conductivity. Some examples are germanium, gallium, arsenide, silicon. So, a conductivity is larger than uh, things like glass insulators, but less than that of metals. And importantly, their conductivity can be controlled using doping, electric field and light. And because of all of this, we have had this technological revolution which we have today. That we have, we have these processors, we have this laser pointer, we have these LEDs, lasers and so on. Now, how do these, how do these semiconductors work? If you put an electron in a semiconductor, you have to understand what happens. So, an electron in a semiconductor behaves as if it is free, as if it is in the vacuum but it has a different mass. Okay. This is called effective mass and the electron so henceforth is called block electron. Okay. Let us suppose we have an isolated silicon atom. The question is how bands form in semiconductors because to understand all physics we have to understand what are bands. So, in isolated silicon atom this outermost shell is empty. But let us suppose we bring lots and lots of silicon atoms together to make a crystal. Now, we are bringing them together, we are reducing the interatomic spacing and these outermost shells they start to hybridize. These orbitals start to hybridize and you create lots and lots of closely spaced levels and they end up making a band at the interatomic spacing which is the natural interatomic spacing of silicon. So, this bottom band is full of electrons, all of the states are filled up there. So, this is called valence band and the top band is called conduction band. Okay. The most important thing to understand physics is called E k diagram. Essentially in the reciprocal space there is this crystal momentum and then there is energy. So, this bands conduction band and valence band mostly they are parabolic in nature and their effective masses which I was talking about here is given as the conduct is as the curvature of these bands. So, inverse of the second derivative of these bands gives us an idea of the effective mass. Now, typically the band gap in semiconductors which is this gap between valence and conduction bands where there is no state lies between infrared and ultraviolet regions. Okay. Now, we talk about optics. Let us suppose you shine a photon and this photon if its energy is sufficiently high enough that it crosses this band gap, the energy is higher than the band gap, then an electron can jump to a conduction band and an electron hole pair is created. Now, this process is optical absorption because the photon was absorbed and electron hole pair was created and then this electron can fall back and give rise to another photon. The process is called photoluminescence or emission. In this process, the momentum has to be conserved like in all of the physics. Photons momentum however, is really, really small compared to this momentum scales that we have in a crystal. Therefore, this transition is mostly direct because photons momentum is roughly a thousand times smaller than the scales that we are dealing with here. So, the final momentum minus initial momentum is almost the same, almost 0. So, this is a direct transition. Now, in, in the semiconductors where this direct transition is the lowest in energy, such semiconductors are called direct band gap semiconductors and these are the semiconductors which are responsible for all light emission technologies that we have today like this pointer which I have in hand or LEDs. However, there are semiconductors very popular ones like silicon and germanium where the bottom of the conduction band and top of the valence band <coughs> for the lowest energy possible in the semiconductor are not at the same point in the k space. So, there you will need to conserve this momentum for emission of a photon. So, this momentum can be given through a phonon. So, then this is a two particle process and two particle processes are not very efficient for an emission of a phono photon. This is why this is a very inefficient emitter of light. However, there are uses of such indirect band gap semiconductors in absorption based uh, devices uh, or, or uh, in these uh, processors and so on. Now, to understand the physics of optics in semiconductors or optical processes, we have to understand the concept of optical joint density of states. So, these are those, these are the number of states which are available for the photons to interact with per unit volume of the crystal. Now, let us suppose we have a bulk semiconductor. By that what I mean is that the dimensions of this crystal is much larger than the Dubroye wavelength of an electron if we place in the semiconductor. 
okay so then we call of a then we talk of a bulk semiconductor in a bulk semiconductor if you have such a transition then it turns out that the joint density of state increases as square root of e okay However, if you reduce the dimension of the semiconductor in one of the directions and make it comparable to the de Broglie wavelength, then this becomes a two dimensional semiconductor and in two dimensional semiconductors such as a qu quantum well, where a thin layer of gallium arsenide which has a lower band gap than the barriers here, then in such a case this is a two dimensional semiconductor because now the electron if it is created here will be, <coughs> will be just confined within this region because there will be a potential barrier which it, it has which it has to overcome. So, in such a case we can have quantization of electron and hole levels and then you can have these optical transitions which are now discrete in energy. So, you will have some resonances which will discrete in energy. So, this process is quantization which all of us study in the in the in our quantum mechanics textbooks which are which this is the first chapter there. And then the density of states which is the number of states available for the photons to interact with per unit volume of the crystal. This is a step like function. So, essentially this is independent of energy, but when you have first transition you have first step, here you have a second transition, you have a second step and so on. Okay. So, this was about density of states. Now, the point is when you create an ele electron hole pair there is a coulomb interaction because these are oppo oppositely charged particles. So, then an exciton is created. Now, an exciton is just like a hydrogen atom where this electron and hole when it is created at some point in space, it is bound by coulomb interaction and behaves like a hydrogen atom for a very short amount of time. So, we can study the physics of artificial hydrogen atoms in solids in these semiconductors and we can uh, tune various things in these hydrogen atoms by applying electric or magnetic fields or doping and so on. I will be talking about these also and this exciton can emit light back electron hole pairs combined and they give rise to a photon again. So, this is excitonic emission. Now, the point to notice here is that the binding energy of this exciton is much lesser in the semiconductor is much lesser than that of hydrogen atom. In hydrogen atoms the binding energy is of the order of 13.6 electron volts. So, it is in electron volts, but here it is 1000 times lesser it is some few milli electron volt to a few tens of milli electron volts. Now, when we talk of room temperature the k t value of the room temperature the energy of the room temperature is of the order of 25 MeV. So, this is a few tens of a few MeV to few tens of MeV. So, we have to go to low temperature so that this exciton is not broken. Okay. So, we have to do all our experiments at low temperatures to understand quantum mechanics. However, in two dimensional case it turns out that the binding energy is theoretically four times that of the 3D case. So, the exciton is strongly bound. It is strongly bound because now you have confined this exciton. So, this is the reason physical reason behind this strong binding of excitons in two dimensional systems. I want to say that the excitons strongly modify the absorption spectrum. Let me tell you how. <coughs> For absorption based devices this is very important to understand. Let us suppose you have a transition an electron hole pair is created an exciton is created in such a quantum well. Okay. Theoretically you expect that this exciton should appear as a very strong resonance just below the band gap. Now, why below the band gap? Because exciton is a bound state and binding reduces the energy. So, this is created below the band gap by an amount equal to the binding energy. So, this is the place where the transition happens, but this is a place of band gap. Now, this is the ground state of an exciton because exciton is just like hydrogen atom. A hydrogen atom has many states here yeah? 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s and so on, but here we are only seeing the ground state, but we could have we could have these excited states of excitons as well 2s, 3s, 4s and so on and we could also have these scattering states of excitons where an electron is not bound to the hole, but electron can scatter through coulomb interaction as well. Yes. So, in this 2D systems, once you form an exciton at this uh, uh, pair, electron hole pair, yes. if you apply a magnetic field, do you see physics of uh, this? Basically, your electrons will now do a cyclotron motion. Correct. I am coming to that in a few slides. And form some Landau levels and all exactly. I am coming to that. Uh, this lifetimes, we have not studied the lifetimes, that is very interesting. 
in principle it squeezes the wave function of an exciton magnetic field and squeezes the wave function so in principle it should reduce the lifetime compared to if it was without uh, magnetic field with the cyclotron i mean the uh, classically thinking if you think of the centrifugal force holding the orbits of the electrons mm, yeah so i mean lifetimes could be a tricky issue because once you squeeze in the wave function of the exciton you increase the binding so then i'm not sure if the lifetime will increase oh that's because of the opposite charges they squeeze in the wave function is squeezed in okay let's go next yeah so now let's zoom into this part of the spectrum so then we also start to see this excited state of this exciton but this is again a simulation for now and then there is a 2d step like function which i have told you i won't go into a details of this but this 2s excited state is very very small you can see compared to this 1s state so if we want to see this 2s states and 3s states and so on what do we do the point is these are very close to this band edge 2s 3s and 4s so you have to somehow separate them in real experiments you you see this uh, these excitonic transitions which are only 1s states okay to see the 2s states or 3s states they are very close to the band gap so they are normally not visible also their intensity is much lesser so they are just merged with the band gap but what do we do if we want to see excited states of these excitons or if we want to do rydberg spectroscopy in that sense on excitons we apply magnetic fields okay so this is one motivation of applying magnetic fields now what happens when we apply magnetic fields the field started with uh, faraday effect faraday effect is the ray there is the change of the or the rotation of the state of polarization of light when linearly polarized light passes through some material and magnetic field is applied across the material so the state of linear polarization changes now this faraday effect has led to many many more discoveries and has opened up many new many new dimensions to physics the reason of faraday effect is the following linearly polarized light which you are incidencing on this material incidencing is there a word i don't know <laughs> i just discovered a word invented a word okay linearly polarized light can be written as the sum of or the superposition of two circular polarization components magnetic field what it does is it introduces a phase difference between these two components and once this light is exiting the superimposed state is rotated because of this phase difference between the left and right circular components so this is faraday effect now this effect is in transmission but in reflection you can pass this light through a material so sorry, oh sorry you can reflect this light from a material which is under a magnetic field similar effect happens the state of polarization rotates and this effect is called kerr effect or the kerr rotation here it's kerr rotation so one is in transmission and one is in rotation so this is michael faraday a picture of michael faraday i don't think it's an original picture but he is demonstrating his faraday effect probably okay now this faraday effect is a very sensitive technique and it provides rich information on the band structure it's very sensitive to magnetic moments it's easy to find if a surface is magnetized or not so there are lots of many applications magnet optical recording and also potential in future spintronic and wellitronic devices now a typical setup is the following for faraday effect you pass light through a hole of a magnet and then there is a cryostat in which a uh, finger hangs this is a metal plate which hangs and this is a cryostat the temperature there is 4 kelvin and you hang your sample there so light passes through the sample magnetic field is applied across the sample and then we take the light back to for detection for detection of faraday rotation try to take this type of pictures right? students this is not a real picture this is uh, this is a real picture so, no don't 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 take your eyes near to laser right? no this is not laser this is just white light it's just lamp <laughs> okay no this is just a path of photon i want to show path of photon okay <laughs> animation anyway a crude animation the best i could do <laughs> okay so there are many things possible faraday and spectroscopy effect spectroscopy on micron scales so that's why i write micro so you can specially probe micron dimensions which is required for studying two dimensional materials temperature ranges and from 4 to 3 25 kelvin and this is small field up to 1.4 tesla not very large field 
let's see how we create strong magnetic fields. Now, with such a magnet, which I showed you here, with such a magnet, you can create up to like three Tesla and you have to cool this magnet down. So, you pass some five liters of water per minute. So, this is how you cool it down and you pass some 200 amperes of current. If you want to create larger fields, we use superconducting magnets where there is a superconductor coil and you immerse this in liquid helium and this becomes a superconductor. So, then you pass some 100 watts of power or something compared to about 3 kilowatt or 10 kilowatt here in this. So, this power consumption is much reduced because now the material has become superconductor. So, there is no power loss and the current of about 100 amperes you can go up to 21 Tesla these days. But what if you want even larger fields? Well, we want larger fields. So, then we go to some specific special facilities such as one is in Grenoble. So, this is a huge magnet compared to the height of Einstein here. This would be like three times higher. A huge magnet and then there are these tubes which are used for running water through them. This water is like you know you have to run 300 liters of water per second to cool this down because this becomes very hot. You use actually tens of megawatts of power with which you can run a small city. So, some special facilities are available in the world. One is in Tallahassee in US, one is this in Grenoble, one is in Nijmegen in Netherlands and so on. So, we can go there and we regularly go there for doing our experiments under high magnetic fields. So, this power is equivalent to like four or five Rajdhani engines, you know, pulling th their compartments together. Okay, so, this is quite a large of power. Now, if you do not trust me that these are, these are huge systems, here are my friends. They were, he was showing us around and these are these huge tubes through which you know you pass water through them and you cool these magnets. So, in Grenoble there are two rivers, they take water from one river with this huge uh, pumps and then they cool the magnet and pass the water to the other river and the entering water is like at 16 degrees and the water emerge uh, com coming out of the magnet is at 95 degrees. So, almost boiling. Okay, now, if we put an exciton under a magnetic field, what happens? This is a CW magnet. How many hours is it operating? You can operate it as long as the power is available. So, we have been doing experiments for 10 hours. So, the ear talk I heard was a pulsed magnetic. Yeah. They have that also. Well, that is in Toulouse actually in France. So, there you can produce very large fields, more than 200 Tesla. Okay, so they, here in this magnet you can produce like 30 Tesla or 35 Tesla. What is the problem with superconducting magnets? It they quench. And so no, so field is exactly. So they become normal. Okay, so now <coughs> let's suppose you put an exciton under a magnetic field. Three things can happen. First, Riemann splitting of the exciton. We know that this effect, the bands would shift and split in energy. Riemann splitting. Then there is Landau level splitting, which uh, Umakant was talking about. This is a pure quantum mechanical effect that the Landau levels are created. I won't go into details when you apply magnetic fields and you can have diamagnetic shift, these three effects. Okay, let us talk about first two of them because they are interesting for th our work. First is Zeeman splitting. Let us suppose you have these spectral lines of the excitons in a quantum well in the absence of magnetic field. So, then these transitions for example, this hole to electron transition is taking place and this is doubly degenerate. So, essentially they if you uh, make circular polarization resolved spectroscopy of this, the two spectra will look exactly the same because they are degenerate. But once you apply magnetic field, the degeneracy is lifted and now sigma negative and sigma positive meaning two degrees of circular polarization are at different energies. Now, let us see when we do circular polarization resolved spectroscopy. So, this experiment was done in TIFR when I had just started my PhD. So, this was under 8 Tesla and we made these two graphs, one is sigma positive, left circular polarization, this is right circular polarization and then there is Zeeman splitting. Okay. Now, this is simple, Zeeman splitting, but what happens in this region? Let us see, in this region we expected excited states earlier which we were not able to see, 2s, 3s and 4s. But when we apply magnetic field, it turns out that the excited states gain intensity and they also blue shift. So, you start to see these excited states just like of a hydrogen atom n equal to 2, n equal to 3 and so on. Now, if you want to do a similar thing on hydrogen atom, you will need a field of about 300,000 Tesla, 3 lakh Tesla because the hydrogen atom has a very strong binding energy. But here since the binding energy is a thousand times less, so you need thousand times less field which is of the order of 8 Tesla 
you can start to see this uh, very nice excited states. In fact, if you use very sensitive spectroscopy techniques such as Mohr spectroscopy, magnet optical curve effect which we talk about, you can start to see many, many, many excited states. So, here we see some 18, some 15 excited states. This was last work when I was doing my PhD and uh, now I will start analyzing this data finally. This uh, data stayed analyzed, unanalyzed, unanalyzed, is that a word? <laughs> <laughs> and now uh, our colleagues uh, will analyze this. Yes. So these various excitations that you see in the presence of black field, these are principal quantum numbers? These are these principal quantum numbers. Yeah. Do they come and become crowded, more and more crowded as you go to higher energies? No, actually at higher energies, what happens is the separation between them is h cross omega. So these are Landau levels essentially. So yeah, so there is a transition between Landau levels, but due to Coulomb effect, they are excited states as well. So, h cross omega is constant. Okay. So, these are Landau levels of the, in the conduction band, the electrons in the conduction band. Electrons in conduction band and holes in valence band, both and then there are transitions between them. So, a transition one can imagine is taking place in, between Landau level of hole and electron. This last sentence I do not understand. You mean because normally there is Z1, Z1 splitting and shape. Correct. Now, what are you comparing? This sentence? Uh. Yeah. So, what happens is like for these things to start to happen, you have to overcome the Coulomb energy. The magnetic energy is like, you know, 10 Tesla is like 1 MeV. Of the order. Yes. So, in a hydrogen atom, say you have an electron in the outer. Yes. Like only electron. Yes. Now, you apply a magnetic field, there will be some Z1 split. There is Z1 effect, yes. Uh, so, S half and minus half. Yes, so yes. Now, there you need a uh, very small tiny magnet. That is true. Now, what what about hydrogen atom that you are comparing? What this 100,000 Tesla if I apply to a hydrogen atom, what will happen? No, no, see, here the Zeeman effect will be there, surely, at, at low fields, yeah. Now, I am telling, I am telling. So, what happens in hydrogen atom when you apply 100,000 Tesla, the excited states start to red, blue shift and they also start to gain intensity. But bef below that, they do not do that. So, the quantum mechanical treatment says that these should blue shift and they should gain intensity, but for hydrogen atom the fields required will be this, but for excitons in gallium arsenide the fields required will be this, that is all is the difference. So, we are able to do these, study these theories in lab experiment. So, you are saying that the sp energy difference in hydrogen atom will shift to blue if you apply Correct. this. Correct. Just the s will keep on shifting. P is optically inactive if I remember, so because of, uh, we'll discuss yeah, we will discuss. Sure. But Ashish, all these things are happening within the gap, right? Yeah, these are all with, no, no, I mean, now the band gap uh, has remained somewhere there. So, how do you then distinguish between? Uh, no, this is a good point actually. Uh, the band gap also should blue shift. That is true. Because of cyclotron effect of free of free electrons, they should also blue shift, land all levels. So, that means like you remain within the gap? It's, it should remain within the gap, because after that there will be free states, these are all bound states still. It, this gas and gas. Okay. So, the third one is diamagnetic shift. What happens is like, you know, the exciton energy, it starts to blue shift slightly. Now, this is a quadratic shift as you keep on increasing magnetic field and this is B square dependent and there are this re, uh, effective masses and Bohr radius. So, you can find effective mass and Bohr radius also by just looking the, at the excitons uh, diamagnetic shift. For example, this oneness state does not shift much, but it only shows this blue, sk this, uh, blue shift diamagnetic shift. So, you can measure these uh, uh, effective masses and so on. Now, let us go from with all this knowledge to the two dimensional materials. I think I am moving slow, but let us see. I will try to come to the real thing quickly. Now, we come to the valleys in two dimensional semiconductors. What do I mean <coughs> by valleys? The point is all of these excitons in the in the gallium arsenide materials and so on, uh, all the action was taking place at the center of the Billouin zone. But all the optical action in some other materials which are 2D semiconductors, 
that takes place at the corners of the blue and so on and these corners are called valleys. I will tell you why. So, in K space, there are these corners of blue and zone which is a hexagonal blue and zone of 2D materials and we call them valleys. Okay. Now, the research started actually in uh, 2004 when graphene was isolated, but that is a semi metal, but we are interested in semiconductors for the moment. So, the, there the research started in 2010 on mono layers of semiconductors when a single layer of MOS2 was isolated. Now, this is an ideal 2D material because this is just a single layer, so you cannot have it thinner. You can have multi layer and bulk semiconductors also which we will talk a bit more. You just use a scotch tape and you put this crystal and make peel off the few layer a few layers and put this on the substrate and then you have this probability of getting some single layers. And this is how it looks like I mean the, the uh, lattice this is a hexagonal lattice. This is an example of this bono layer peeled on a substrate. So, you can actually see a single layer under a microscope if you put them on some special substrate where some interference effects you know increase the visibility. Now, lots and lots of 2D materials start to appear. For example, there are the semiconductors which we will be talking about, there are semiconductors and magnets, insulators and so on. We will talk about these transition metal dichalcogenides <coughs> and they are very advantageous for industry in future. Because now they are they have low cost and we can produce large area with very small material they are because they are very thin their optical transparency can be adjusted very low ro, very little raw material is required it covers a broad spectrum also starting from zero band gap which is graphene to very large band gaps which is HBN hexagonal boron nitride which is more than 6 electron volts. You can create van der Waals heterostructures by putting them on the top of each other Mukul keeps on working with all of these things as well. <coughs> And uh, flexible electronics such as LEDs, photovoltaics, they have already been demonstrated using these materials. So, they are moving towards industry as well. One can look at some roadback of, phys of physics like MOS2 transistor was developed in 2011 and then this field of valetronics started where I discussed about these uh, valleys in the K space. Now, the Brillouin zone is hexagonal and all the optical action actually takes place at these corners of the Brillouin zone. And it turns out that these adjacent valleys have all magnetic moments reversed because there is no inversion symmetry. I will not go into details, but the point is that these adjacent valleys are sensitive to only a single state of circular polarization. This left and right circularly polarized light attacks the neighbor neighboring valleys. So, this is why these valleys ha have caught a lot of attention recently because just like in the area of spintronics, you are able to manipulate spins. Similarly, in this area which is to going towards valleytronics, since you are able to selectively address these valleys, they have, these have some magnetic moments, some very strong magnetic moments. Therefore, you are able to think of some devices just on the basis of these magnetic moments because you are able to select them or address them separately. So, you can circularly polarized, uh, you can address these uh, valleys with circular polarization and I talked about. Electronics. Now, this has many applications or potential applications in quantum computation and so on, because you can create a coherent superposition state of these valleys. Now, let me jump directly to 2014 when I started working on this field and in 15 we showed that single photon emitter emitters are available in some of these 2D materials which also have some applications or some potential applications in quantum communication where there are some sharp lines which appear in the luminescence spectra of some of these materials and they showed anti bunching. So, this anti bunching is the proof that these are single photon emission centers. Okay, I will not go into details of this as well because this has no magnetic field yet. Okay. Next we talk of magnetic fields. Now, in 2015 valleys were connected with magnetic fields people were able to study valleys under magnetic fields and some exciting things were found. One of the effect is now valley Zeeman effect which is obvious that now two valleys are ear earlier they are degenerate in energy, but now their energy can be shifted by just applying magnetic field. These are our contributions to this field so far. Now, the point is like here these valleys are degenerate okay, without the magnetic field. So, this is conduction band and valence band and the two neighboring valleys I am making here k plus and k minus I call them and they can they can be selected with left circular and right circular polarization. Now, once you apply magnetic field their bands move. 
so sigma plus reduces in energy and sigma minus increases in energy and you have valley c manifest as simple as that so this neighboring sides they have uh, because of some coupling they are inverted is it yeah so the uh, there is a lack of inversion symmetry because you know bilayer is inversion symmetric but single layer is not inversion symmetric so the valley moments are uh, separated in k space but this is a highly theoretical thing i think mukul will be able to answer it's this not better speed, it's pseudo no pseudo spins, spins. i wanted to say that uh, yeah otherwise people would think that there is a magnetism in it yeah no i understand yeah i'm not using this buzzword for now <laughs> so okay. that is nothing to do with the spins that we use. correct okay so then we move on and in 2017 some two dimensional magnets were discovered so magnetism or spontaneous magnetization was found to appear in some single layers of some materials like cri3 crgt3 and so on many people here are working on these two dimensional magnets and anti ferromagnets like ashna mukul and so on and in 2017 we discover some special kinds of excitons where electron and hole are in neighboring layers of the crystal now this was new for us and this was uh, very exciting time i will tell why again and there were some more things so in this talk i will discuss some of crux of some of the papers and i won't take uh, more than 20 minutes okay let me tell you about some of my favorite results so far of course we won't be able to tell all of them but a few of them let's talk about just excitons in monolayers and when we apply magnetic field to them what happens so we are going to talk about zeeman spectroscopy of monolayers this is essentially a crux of all these papers let's take a material which is molybdenum ditelluride <coughs> again a single layer this has two excitons visible in this material around infrared region of energy because there are two kinds of bands so one transition is there and one is there so what we are checking is reflectance spectrum so this is energy and this is reflectance now if we have to apply magnetic field we have to take this sample to 30 tesla in liquid helium and in 2010 in tifr i had experience of building such probes so i just replicated that experience built a probe and to measure reflectance spectrum we put the sample down in 30 tesla magnetic field at 4 kelvin and immediately we see the splitting or zeeman splitting of lines and now if you have delta e equals to g mu b b which is a zeeman splitting then the g factor was found to be equal to minus 4 between these split lines now why minus 4 the reason is the following a very hand waving reason is the following these are the two valleys again there are three types of magnetic moments responsible for doing this zeeman effects but only one is dominant one at the bottom of this conduction band or top of the valence band there are carriers which have some spins so these spins if i apply magnetic field they move in the same direction because the spin is conserved in an optical transition the spin stays the same so both spins move with the same amount so this does not change the exciton energy okay the other moment which is uh, there is coupled to these valleys that's called a valley magnetic moment and when magnetic field couples to that valley magnetic moment also takes the two bands in the same direction again again no energy change so this moves up this moves down but the total energy difference stays the same still no degeneracy lift so far the third thing is there on the top of the valence band or the here the top of the valence band and that's the orbital magnetic moment because this is made up of d orbitals the top of the valence band which has a magnetic moment of either plus 2 or minus 2 so this takes it up by plus 2 this takes it down by minus 2 so 2 plus 2 is 4 this is the simplest thing that these are the d orbitals which lead to a g factor of minus 4 okay so g factors of excitons in all monolayers which we have studied in five materials of this category are all minus 4 let's talk about something which is not three particle state i have been talking about excitons excitons are two particle states just like hydrogen atom let's suppose i charge this hydrogen atom i add an extra electron so h negative the analog of h negative is called a trion 
So let's study trions. Now the point is the trions will be created if you have an excess carrier population in the semiconductor. You have extra electrons, let's say, or extra holes. So if you have extra holes, you will have positively charged trions. If you have extra electrons, you will have negatively charged trions. So material has to be either n-doped or p-doped. Let's suppose we have n-doped material. Then what would happen is we will have okay at large carrier densities which can be easily found in these materials. What happens is there are these excess carriers which are in conduction bands of these two valleys. Now uh, we are you know separately going to address these valleys. Earlier we were talking of excitons but now we will address these valleys separately or the carriers in these valleys separately just using optical means. The point is these two valleys are degenerate. They have same energy so they will have an equal population of excess carriers. Both of them will have same number of electrons because they are at the same energy. But once you apply magnetic field, if one moves up if and the other one moves down, you will have a population transfer from one of the valleys to the other. So that is this, one moves down, one stays up when you apply magnetic field and you have population transfer. So that means now we should be able to study directly the Zeeman effect of conduction band because earlier we were able to probe only Zeeman effect of excitons. But if the, we are able to do this, then we should be able to directly study Zeeman effect of the conduction bands. Secondly, since we are creating these trions, they tri these trions show up in optical signatures. They have uh, an optical signature. So they show up in the reflectance spectra. So the trions in this valley should vanish and in this valley they should gain a lot of strength because now they have extra charges only in this valley. So one of the circular polarizations should be very bright and the other circular polarization should just go away. So this is exactly what we saw. So in the at zero Tesla magnetic field, there is this trion in MOSE2. So this is MOSE2 molybdenum disilinide monolayer. And this blue and red lines, which are the two circular polarization, they look the same. But once you increase the magnetic field, there is a strong polarization because the carriers are shifting to the other side. So this is the valley polarization of trions. So, but this is magnetic field induced. Okay, so we can use magnetic field to change or to tune the polarization or tune the population of carriers between two valleys. But the area is not conserved, some of the areas. Some of the areas might not be conserved because this follows a Fermi Dirac distribution. That is true. And then there is optical strength. Now optical strength depends on how much uh, of the carriers you are actually uh, able to interact with photons. So that goes non-linearly. So this is why there is a saturation. Yeah, the oscillator strength. The oscillator strength of uh, these additional carriers is going to be different. Yes, because you know the os oscillator strength is maximum at the center of the band. But as you are filling the band, you are actually making transitions at the corner, at the outside the light cone. So then the oscillator strength reduces there. So this is a non-linear thing. This we actually checked in the recent paper in 2020 that also follows this. So now the trion oscillator strength which I am talking about here this follows a Fermi Dirac distribution function where there is this uh, delta ECB which is the Zeeman splitting of these two valleys and this Zeeman splitting can be found and we found the G factors of uh, conduction bands directly. The message here is that we can tune the population. Now if you want to make some things like valetronic gates where you want to make some valetronic devices you need to do two things you have to control the phase between the valleys and you have to control the population difference between two valleys so this is the control of population difference but just using magnetic fields these are not 2d material this is 2d material so do you still have band or are they discrete no this is a band this is a band yeah because your uh, dimensions are 2d no no i mean in xy plane ah. this is a band Okay, now the question is here we have used very large fields to tune all of this like 30 Tesla but what if we want to make devices. Now for making devices we should be able to use small fields and for small fields if we are able to tune all these populations it should be exciting but for that we have to wait until the end of the talk. I have an idea which I am going to try in, in ICER. Okay. Third, interlayer excitons. These excitons are those where electron and hole pair are spatially separated. Okay, now these excitons, since they have spatially separated electro electron and hole pairs, meaning an electron is just in the upper layer and hole is in the bottom layer, 
therefore they are longer living excitons the point is the following in 2014 a paper appeared from uh, the group which actually started this field of 2d mat 2d semiconductors now this paper said that if you put an exciton in a bulk of this material the exciton will behave like a 3d exciton this will have a square root of e of density of states and so on but this was counterintuitive to us i immediately started thinking that if the interlayer interaction between these layers is so weak that we are able to just peel them off it's possible that the electrons and holes are also not talking much to each other so that would mean that actually if you put, put an electron hole pair this should not be very delocalized in this direction this should be actually delocalized this should actually be localized mostly localized within this xy plane so this should not be 3d but it should more be 2d so even the bulk should be 2d so we set out to check this if the bulk should be 2d what should be the signatures well i'll tell you what should be the signatures first you should have intra layer excitons meaning excitons which are just confined within layers okay people were all working with mono layers and so on we were also working with mono layers but if we are able to study two dimensional physics just with bulk material that should be very nice because bulk materials are available everywhere so you don't have to do much than to peel very thin layers off and so on so there should be intra layer excitons and there should be inter layer excitons as well because now electrons and holes should lie in the neighboring layers and there could be these in excitonic interactions which are coulomb like between neighboring layers now how do we see them well the apply idea is to apply magnetic fields now this work summarizes these three papers okay interlayer excitons they have rich physics they are interesting for bose einstein condensation i just put this slide in here because umakant is sitting here uh, so there are lots and lots of papers which keep appearing about uh, excitons and bose einstein condensation of excitons in fact shovik datta is also working on all of these things okay there are recent papers on how to create superfluids using indirect excitons or interlayer excitons so this is why these are exciting now this was our prediction that they should exist in multi layer structures the point is that these two excitons if one does a back of the envelope band structure if we make band structure we know that their zeeman splitting should just be opposite so that that is one signature that there should be intra layer and inter layer excitons so if you have two peaks lying close by which have opposite zeeman splitting that could be one signature that there are inter layer excitons so we have to check that so we have to apply magnetic field and check zeeman splittings so let's take a look at this spectrum now this is bulk mote2 so there is some peak here there are two peaks here and we have to see what these are it turns out that this is a normal looking like exciton which is an intra layer exciton and this is an inter layer exciton like this so i'll tell you how we just apply magnetic fields and we check their zeeman effect here the zeeman splitting turns out to be of the opposite sign than this okay so if i just you know plot their splitting separately so this third peak has a zeeman splitting which is opposite than that of than that of uh, this peak so there are these zeeman splittings so g factor here is plus 4 here it's of the order of minus 3 now this is a bulk material this is why the g factor deviates from the value of minus 4 but it's still negative the other thing is if you have some interlayer exciton this is a spatially separated exciton so this is loosely bound compared to the other exciton which is more strongly bound so when you have something loosely bound when you have something which is a which has a large radius it has a larger diamagnetic shift also so we measure the diamagnetic shift and we check that this is a larger shift and this is a smaller shift so this is the normal exciton and this is the interlayer exciton the third is the interlayer exciton our colleagues also did theoretical calculations by solving bethe salpeter equation which mukul does as well and they found that there should be these excitations in the bulk of these materials which should have a wave function which is mostly localized within the layer and their calculations quite agreed with the energies with with uh, which uh, we found in our paper yes sorry i got i got slightly confused uh, the interlayer exciton that is loose the power right why is it that its binding energy is uh, comparable to that of the uh, intra layer exciton in, in fact it's more than no no that no so the the band gap is somewhere there so this is less strongly bound and this is more strongly bound so and this is a bulk material so band gap has reduced quite a bit already so this band the binding energy of interlayer exciton here would be probably half of that of the intra layer exciton 
Yeah, these are in. Yeah, actually, this uh, separation here is 50 MeV, and the binding energy of uh, this is like uh, about uh, 90 MeV. So that would be 40 MeV or something. Okay. Now I claim that actually we can control the phase between these valleys as well. So I'll show you one experiment, which was one of my favorite ones. So we can control the phase using magnetic fields. Okay. What I mean is the following. We have two valleys, both of them couple with the circular polarized light. Now, if we are able to control the phase between two circular polarizations, then we are cl approaching closer to the valetronic gates, which are important for quantum computation. Now, these two valleys, since they are coupled to the circularly polarized light, what if we shine linearly polarized light? So, linear polarization is a super superimposed state of two circular polarization. It turns out that this linearly polarized light actually creates a quantum superimposed states of these two, these two valleys. So, it excites both values together as a single state. This is a quantum superimposed state. And what happens is the emission is also linearly polarized. So, you change the polarization of the incident polarization, the emission also keeps on changing the polarization. So, this, this means that the valleys are coupled and this phenomena is called valley coherence. So, this phenomena was discovered actually in 2013. But we wanted to see if we can do something more to that by just applying magnetic fields. Because we are magnetic field guys, so we just apply magnetic field and see what happens. Not only that, we actually had some intuition. The intuition was that of course, the, 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 uh, you know, the two valleys will couple differently to magnetic fields. So, energy of one valley will go down, other valley will go up. So, there should be a phase difference. Okay. So, when we apply magnetic field, sigma positive reduces, sigma negative increases, but what happens? That is the question, that is what we ask. So, the answer is, I will just give you short answer from this paper. The answer is that the emission polarization rotates with respect to the original polarization, the excitation polarization. So, the two valleys have a phase difference. So, it is similar to just say, let us say curve effect, where you have a rotation of plane of polarization when you have created a phase difference, but here you have created the phase difference in the two valleys by changing their energies. And this phase difference appears in the emission process and not in reflection or transmission, which was Kerr or Faraday effect, this is emission. So, here the valleys are emitting as a superimposed state, but with different phase now. So, we have controlled phase. But here again, for this control of phase, we used very large fields, like this field is 25 Tesla here. What if we want to do all of this at low field? That is the ultimate goal of this field field of research, not magnetic field. Well, is it possible using small fields? For that, again, we wait for a few more minutes and I am approaching towards the end to reveal the secret. Well, keeping all of this in mind, since we have to use low fields, we have to create now some precision spectroscopy techniques, where we can study all these phenomena at low fields. And for that, we have to be able to resolve all these Zeeman splittings and all these polarization effects under low fields. But now, under low fields, these effects are very, very small. So, you have to be able to do that. But for that, you have to devise new technologies. And that is what we did in the last two years. We devised a new technique. This was a new Faraday rotation spectroscopy method. It was required because of the following reason. When you do such a spectrum spectroscopy, such as Kerr spectroscopy or Faraday spectroscopy, which I talked about earlier. To take one spectrum, you actually have to wait for 4 or 5 hours or even 10 hours for getting to this one spectrum. Now, you have to keep your sample stable in the cryostat for 10 hours. Now, if you are working with a two dimensional material and this material is in a cryostat, the spot size is of the order of a micron and if this material moves by a few, few tens of nanometers, we notice great differences in the signal from various locations, because of various non-uniformities in the layers and so on. So, the material does not stay stable for 10 hours, it is out of question. What we realized is that the material stays stable in for, for like maybe 2 or 3 minutes, that is all. And then it goes out of the spot of the laser. So, can we do something which produces similar results, but in 2 minutes, that was the question. Now, here what you do is, you actually keep on changing the wavelength of light. You keep on changing the energy of this photon and keep on measuring this signal. So, this is the way the spectroscopy is done and this is how it is done throughout the world. 
but if we are able to measure all these wavelengths together in one shot in one single shot let us say using a CCD chip then we should be able to reduce the time of measurement by measurement by many orders of magnitude and this is exactly what we did. So, this this is all yeah. So, essentially I pass linear polarization of light pass through some thing called beam displacer. So, this beam displacer you know creates two components of linear polarization these and both of them go to the spectrometer together on the CCD chip. Now, these components are wavelength resolved. So, you get in one shot in information corresponding to the two circular polarization in one shot for as a function of wavelength and you keep on recording these spectra and what we find is that within two or three minutes of measurement time we are able to get same sensitivity okay three or four minutes as that of the previous measurement. So, then we are able to now measure the things on two dimensional materials we have submitted a paper if we measure this uh, now Zeeman effects just using Faraday rotation because when there is Faraday rotation there is Zeeman effect or when there is Zeeman effect there is Faraday rotation I should have said the other way. So, there is Zeeman effect of excitons and we are able to see this Zeeman effect just by increasing magnetic field now. Here I am seeing something this Zeeman effect very nicely very clear signal just at 0 0.2 tesla earlier we had to apply at least 10 tesla to see all of this because the signal is very low the splitting is very low, but now we have improved it by maybe two orders of magnitude or something. So, this is our innovation and we can use now this much lower field compared to 4 5 tesla to measure all of the sigma splittings and g factors and so on. What else can be done using this technique? Well, what we have found recently is that for example, this MOSC 2 the rotation is so large just through this single layer of material this layer is just single layer thick and it can rotate 2.2 degrees of light at 1.4 tesla. Now, this is huge I want to tell you how one can imagine that if you are able to rotate the plane of polarization by 2 degrees by passing light just through a single layer of material. If we compare this with uh, other things which are available in literature so far everywhere we have this uh, numbers of the order of 10 power 3 or 10 power 4, but in this material it is 10 power 7. What this number is this number is amount of rotation per tesla per meter length of the material this is called wedded constant. So, this is the largest that we have ever found in literature. So, we have just submitted this paper called giant Faraday rotation in monolayer semiconductors and this was only possible Okay, this has to be submitted I think <laughs> we, we are still discussing in a few days we submit we submitted the previous one yeah. So, uh, we are excited about this technique and we are going to use this and patent this and so on. We can also measure other things like hysteresis curves as a function of wavelength and so on on various thin films of ferrimagnets, ferromagnets and so on, but that is just a byproduct. Lot can be done and a lot can be done with uh, in collaboration with many other labs in ICER using all these methods. Well, future now I was asking my question was if all of this which I was telling tuning the population or tuning the phase if we can do with small fields is that possible. First of all we have a technique now we can just measure that effect but can we tune that as well the answer is this if we have some two dimensional magnetic materials which create which we make the substrate of these two dimensional semiconductors meaning if we create interfaces of 2D materials 2D magnetic materials and 2D semiconductors then there is a it is found that there is a strong field at this interface already. So, CRI 3 is a 2D magnet and WSE 2 is a 2D semiconductor now the magnetic field is inherently present there in fact it is of the order of 15 tesla which is already present there just due to the proximity of this layer. In fact this polarization which is shown here I will not go into details now we can tune this polarization with a small external magnetic field like 2 tesla. So, this is possible now earlier for such a polarization you needed probably 30 tesla, but now you can tune this with 2 tesla. So, you can tune the population with 2 tesla. So, what if we create such structures and now start tuning the population of electrons directly by creating trions or studying trions that is doable now. Similarly, we can create these excitons and study their phases by the small external magnetic fields which are available in the laboratories here. So, we can do that. So, there can be lot of new physics 
towards a new generation of quantum devices. We can control this trion population, control trion current specific to a valley. We can control valley phase with a tiny external magnetic field. A control should have an R. Okay. So, we have to probe all these effects using all these methods which we will develop at ICER Pune as soon as some money is available. <laughs> a difficult time for experimentalists when they come back to India. Lots of ambition, but no money. So, we have to slowly build these things. Okay. All these people know it very well. <laughs> no, there are a few more slides if you want to, to clap again. <laughs> Most welcome. So, in summary, <laughs> semiconductors are everywhere. Valleys are exciting for physics and devices. Valleys can be probed or controlled through magnetic fields. And we have developed high precision techniques. These are the way to go for 2D materials. I am also very active as a science communicator. So please uh, join us on our efforts for taking the excitement of science in local languages to all corners of India. We have a team called India Science Theatre, which have many nice communicators from all over the country and across the world who are helping us with in doing various programs. So, we do lots of shows. There are some examples. Please subscribe to our channel. Okay. So, I thank all the collaborators and I thank you all for listening. Thank you, Ashish. Wonderful talk. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah, hi. So, very nice talk. So, all these materials that you have shown, they are made by mechanical exploration. Yes. Yeah, so defects we can probe actually using luminescence studies. Unfortunately, defects are not very sensitive to the reflectance or uh, absorption based spectroscopy because the defects oscillator strength is really small. So, they do not even appear in uh, reflectance or absorption spectra, but in luminescence they appear surely and we see lots of differences in various kinds of sources of crystals and samples and so on. In fact, in fact, when we try to do all of this with CVD grown samples, now this is three years back, I do not know the quality now. The defect densities used to be much larger than the, than the single crystal grown samples and exfoliated ones. How sensitive are they with the size of the crystals? So, these will be typically micron size. Yes. So, uh, so, that is sufficient to extract all the physics that you know and that size is it. Yeah, one micron is sufficient. Yeah, that is true. Thanks. Anybody else? There was one more hand raised. I don't know where. Probably one behind you. Okay. If there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Ajit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. And, uh, yeah, you can go back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a part I of Technology you all Foundation would like to give a small moment. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, thank you all. I think uh, you guys are checking our website. There is call for proposal for, from startups. So, even if you have an idea, we can you to from idea to the prototype. If it relates to quantum technologies or even enabling technologies, you know, that support quantum technologies, we are happy to fund you under Praya scheme or entrepreneur in residence for those who are passing out specially or the seed fund scheme. So, do check our website under the opportunities tab. So, this is one thing. The other is technology development. So, those who are PhDs or postdocs interested in setting up your own group and you have a nice, uh, you know, project proposal going on in your head, please write it down and apply to us. Um, so there is a uh, huge funding uh, available for you all. So thank you so much. I will see you again in the next series of frequent. Uh, uh, thank you.